You're listening to a download from the outdoorstation.co.uk. Number four, three, nine. Hello and welcome back to part six of this eight-part series, which covers my April 2017 120-mile walk on Devon's coast to coast along the Two Moors Way. From Wembury in the south across Dartmoor and Exmoor to Lynmouth in the north. I've had numerous emails asking if this path would be suitable for the average walker or backpacker, and my answer would most definitely be yes. Naturally, there are one or two places here and there you have to keep an eye on for navigation or look for fallen signs, and at times these signs become just little blobs of paint on distant gates or walls. I've no idea why, but on the whole, the answer has to be yes. But only on the proviso that you book your accommodation in advance, be it camping or more luxurious. It takes a lot of pressure off and will increase your enjoyment even more. Also, I'd recommend reading the Cicerone Press Two Moors Way guidebook, as many of the confusing sections will become clear. In the previous episode, you will have heard my concerns about getting to Lynmouth too soon. I had allowed eight days to do this, and I could have easily completed it in five or six, because I was pushing on. So, as you'll hear, I'm now trying to ease off as much as I can, which results in today's walk of just 16 kilometres, or 10 miles, to Tar Steps where a major dilemma really manifests itself. However, I'm sure you all want to hear how my night went sleeping with the chickens at West Kidland Farm. Well, it went something like this. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to my world at quarter past five in the morning. (laughs) And so a day at the farmyard begins. Roast chicken for lunch, anybody? On a Sunday? <laughs> There's no earplugs that could do that justice. Water boiling once for my brew, which <laughs> I'm now enjoying, and I'm boiling it again because I've got a couple of lovely fresh eggs here from these <laughs> chickens behind. Ah, oh, dear me! Well, I, sl- I slept surprisingly well, very well actually, until my five o'clock earlier morning call. But even then, after that, once you got used to the sound was there, I just dropped off again. So it was my alarm that set off at 6.30 and I was getting ready to go. So since then, I've been picking up lots of bits of off cuts of, off cuts of wood from the chopping block where it's all just gone everywhere. Yeah, just got the, f- <laughs> just got the stove going to have a couple of boiled eggs for breakfast. Hardly the fried egg and bacon sandwich that I fantasised about in the bedroom when I, was pack- when I was packing all my clothes but hey, this is part of living the dream isn't it really um, been outside already and there's definitely uh, rain in the air uh, it's certainly 
going to be a wet one today so I need to fortify myself so I'm taking the opportunity to just repack everything make sure everything is packed away in dry bags and so I'm ready for the oh we go rolling boil right in goes one egg in goes the other egg excellent all right so we just need to set the timer for a 10 minute rolling boil I can hear them bubbling away in there Yes, so we're not too sure what's going to happen to the next couple of days, really. Whether I try and find a world camp, try and find, well, anything, really. I suppose what um, experience tells me that I'm dreading would be being sopping wet, turning up somewhere cold and despondent, and just not being able to find anything. Uh, so my fingers will be truly crossed. Uh, I may call into, there's a couple of, in fact, there's three pubs I think and there's one at Tar Steps one at Withy Pool and one at Simon's Bath I know Simon's Bath got a hotel whether they've got a campsite or camping facilities there or not I don't know but we'll we'll see where it leads us it's just gone seven o'clock now so once I've had my breakfast and finished my tea and cleared up I shall get out of here and get going rain's due in at ten o'clock but as I say I think it's already started in a fine mist I'll speak to you later. <laughs> I'll speak to you later. Eight fifteen, and although there was that wet mist feel to the air earlier on, it's gone for the moment and left a lovely sunny morning, which is helpful as I'm just started the long walk back to no stone from the farm it's about two and a half k something like that and you can hear i've got the a361 next to me which i'll be pulling away from shortly when i go past the distant turbines uh, so we'll see what the story is i had my boiled eggs fresh from the chucks and that cockerel, well there was two cockerels there, beautiful cockerels, but what a racket. Oh yes, today's going to be an interesting one and see what transpires, to be honest. Because once the weather changes, everything changes. And I have been blessed so far, so it's only fair that I get a bit of the bad stuff as well. Once we get away from the road... It turns from a tarmac driveway into a bridle path with some deep ruts in it. But it goes down quite a steep hill. And of course, unfortunately, comes goes up a rather steep hill the other side. But that'll wake the legs up this morning. And then we'll see what happens when we get back on the two moors way. I'm standing by the uh, A361 where the farm track turns into the bridle path which I'm about to head back to No Stone on. And as an aside, just above me on a slight hill are nine wind turbines. And Christine from West Kidland Farm where I stayed last night uh, was telling me basically about the controversy involved in, in these nine wind turbines going on and how much it split the community. And although there's been a serious investment uh, into the different communities surrounding the turbines, you know, X amount of thousands has gone in and they've spent it on community buses and that sort of stuff, it really has been very divisive, so much so that the people who own the land have been completely ostracised by everybody else uh, in the surrounding areas. Uh, just a little aside, really, it's interesting how diverse and how... Um, I mean, obviously on one hand, yeah, eco-friendly. On another, it just spoils a view, and it really does. It doesn't matter where, where you go now in this area of Devon, you can see these nine turbines. Uh, and so obviously it's a fairly divisive, controversial, eco-friendly, energy-generating system. And so going back to talking about the farm, West Kidland Farm, uh, you may be able to find it on a website. She seems to be having problems with websites and content and things. If you do want to camp there... It is very, very basic, and as I say, the field that you could camp in is right next to the A361, 
which I was like Sunday morning now it's fairly quiet um, obviously on a busy weekend you'd certainly notice it but it depends where you come from they were telling me they have somebody come from London they think it's remarkably quiet it's all about your personal perspective really so as I head away from the road I'm starting to go down this uh, bridle path now to get back to No Stone. Well, here it comes, slightly earlier than predicted. Just gone nine o'clock rather than ten o'clock. It's just started to uh, drizzle, I think is the technical term. Packed everything ready for it. Looking at the cloud, it doesn't look like it's going to be heavy and all day, but who knows? The BBC can sometimes be wrong. But it's just a flat, cloudy day. No definition to the clouds at all. Right, onwards and upwards. No Stone is a sleepy little idyll, with its curious one Michelin star pub, the Mason's Arms, and mm, not much else. The path from here gently undulates to Yo Mill, where there is camping, but you'll need to hunt for it. The road section after Yo to Bad Lake Moor Cross, I think was probably the most boring section of the trip. Not only zero views, thanks to the high-sided road embankments, but as you'll hear, a real stinker of a climb all the way up to Bad Lake Cross. If anyone offers you a lift from West Anstey up to, I think it's, I can't, I haven't got my glasses on, so I think it's Bad Lake or Brad Lake, Brad Rake Moor Cross, take it, flipping heck. That's a good kilometre, steady climb. Whew. And the rain has sort of blown over, which is a bit frustrating because obviously I've got all my wet weather gear on, so I'm like really clammy. So I think I'm going to strip off, take the trousers off when I get to this cross. 10.20 and looking back, those wind turbines are on the horizon, well in the distance. So I've covered a reasonable distance, very uh, picturesque again. For those people wondering, yes, I have got wet feet from going through the wet grass now, but they've dried off in the last half hour. As I say, the wind and the rain has just sort of passed over me and these high embankments sort of sh shelters you a bit so it tends to uh, not let much through now I'm looking across to Exmoor and if that's not Exmoor I don't know what is so looks like I finally reached the fringes and no doubt I will see a sign at some stage which tells me it's Exmoor Oh, now ahead of me, is that the stone? The stone, the official marker of the Two Moors Way. I believe it is. I must take a picture of that. Bad Lake Moor, so I'm at the Bad Lake Moor crossing. So uh, I did get that wrong, sorry about that. So it's the Bad Lake Mall crossroads or crossing. I've got the official big two moors stone in front of me. Just going across a cattle grid. Lynmouth, 24 miles. Ivy Bridge, 78. Only 24 miles to go, I could finish today. What did I say, 10.20? Oh no, it's five to 11 now. Yes, it's the official stone. I must take a picture of this. 
and I'm finally on Exmoor. And no, I don't know what that squeak in my rucksack is. I think it's the straps. You're listening to The Outdoor Station, the home of UK-based audio and video podcasts for lovers of the great outdoors everywhere. Since 2005, over 9 million people have listened and over 2 million have watched the videos. Sharing the passion, appreciation and understanding for the outdoors world. Now here's a dilemma. It's two o'clock in the afternoon. I've turned up at uh, Tar Steps and there's Tar's Farm. And it's a really lovely character pub serving the most fantastic food as well as a range of alcoholic refreshments. I've just partaken of their Sunday lunch, which was magnificent. Wonderful beef, fantastic Yorkshire puds, horseradish, all the trimmings, wonderful, really, really good, and a couple of Guinness as well. And I was inquiring about camping and expecting them to tell me, as they did, about Howell's Farm, which is uh, just up the road, well, probably a mile or so, uphill across Common, off the Two Moors Way track. But then the landlady told me about the fact that they allow camping down by the river on their land, right beside Tar Steps wild camping and you're welcome to use the facilities at night and eight o'clock in the morning when they open up and they'll even provide a bacon sandwich free of charge not the bacon sandwich but the camping how about that for a dilemma so do i a carry on wondering what's going to happen next and hope for the best b go up to hell's farm or c stay here for the rest of the afternoon and then go down the bank and try and pitch my tarp uh, at dusk which is going to be a long way away I mean, bear in mind it's two o'clock and it's not dusk till seven. Hmm. What would you do? While I was sitting there at the bar, there was much talk amongst the locals about the weather and the forecast of heavy rain coming in that early evening. So there I am, sitting in a warm, dry bar having eaten a super Sunday lunch, surrounded by excellent company, with a wonderful pint in front of me, thinking about my options. Now, what is a backpacker to do? If you're a keen podcast listener to The Outdoor Station, you will have heard me mention once, possibly twice, Lee and Tony during the TGO Challenge epic series of podcasts. They're well known in the TGO Challenge circle, but most of all, we've had many occasions where they would hold up the bar at the pub and top up with Guinness, while Rose and I would go to the campsite, get the tent sorted, get all the various things done and dusted and washed and whatever, before joining them and uh, sharing a meal. And many occasions... On many occasions when that happens, it's generally a wet, miserable day. And by the purest of purest of purest of coincidences, in the period of time that Rose and I have been doing the dutiful camping thing, they've managed to secure a room in a hotel that was already fully booked. Don't ask me how they do it. They've done it on more than a few occasions, particularly to me. When I'm with them, I'm on my knees... And they're like, I'm st- we're staying here for another one. I'm going, no, no, I'm going. I'll be back in a minute. And when I get back, uh, well, we've actually got the last room or the last hut or the last luxurious apartment. But whatever it is, they somehow managed to pick it up all without leaving the bar. Well, today I have to make a confession. I mentioned earlier on I had my three dilemmas, which was either to stay at the bar and then camp in the field down by the river to plough on ahead and see what comes because I know that there was no campsite to such so it would have to be a wild camp and it was also in a very awkward area 
and the third thing was to head over to another campsite which was a couple of miles off track that was a kettle just boiling I just made myself a cup of tea and then the Tony and Lee option came to mind and it is a bank holiday weekend and I fully expected the answer to be no but I said do you happen to have a room free tonight and the lady behind the bar said as it happens we have one single room left so that solved my dilemma in many ways of the other three because I needed somewhere to just basically put my feet up for a few hours and if a comfortable bed was thrown in with it with an ensuite and a deep bath and television and tea making facilities well that was a bonus so I've done a Lee and Tony I've basically got the last room in the hotel at the Tar Farm Inn really really nice I have to say the place is lovely lovely character to it lovely food a lovely bar atmosphere and the room's really nice as well so I'm really roughing it tonight so my wild camping plans have gone slightly awry but you see it's all about a timing thing because I'm I'm going to get to Lynmouth far too early and I know Lynmouth is fully booked up because I've made several inquiries about getting a room there for when I finish so I've got to lose basically 20 hours somewhere so I don't overshoot myself completely and it was probably because of the last two long days but of course I only did those because I found a place to pitch that was comfortable as it were it was still a semi-wild camp it was in a field but somebody said yes you can go and camp there and last night of course was slightly unusual it was very unusual but it still was in principle a field and I could have camped there should I have wished to do so this is me seeking your forgiveness really this this is the roughy tufty part of me gone soft for a night and I have to say I haven't had a deep bath for a very very long time particularly one that's long enough for me and it's being a luxury place it's got all sorts of oils and opulent smellies and things like that things that girls like so I've just sat and bathed and wallowed and my feet have gone thank you and my thighs gone thank you and my stomach's gone oh thank you so with all of them thanking me, the least I can do now is have a cup of tea, a big bar of chocolate, and look forward to my next meal. And for Lee and Tony, I might just have a couple of Guinness too. And so once again, my wild camping plans go astray. I sat that evening enjoying another excellent meal, staring out of the window at the pouring rain which continued through the night. Wild camping? Who would wild camp under a tarp in weather such as this? They must be mad. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To hear or see more from our extensive free library, please visit theoutdoorsstation.co.uk. Thank you.